All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the sixth week of RGPLE um, Symposium on Data Analytics and IoT. My name is Fatima Jalali, and I'm one of the organizers of this symposium. As you may know, this symposium is a series of talks um, over eight weeks on IoT and the related topic, which is organized by RGPLE Victorian section. And more, specific, more specifically, it's a collaboration uh, between IEEE CIS community, IEEE IoT community, and IEEE Melbourne Uni student branch. Um, so just uh, before we get started, just a few um, uh, like notes about uh, like housekeeping notes. Uh, this session will going to be about one hour and our guest speaker will give a presentation uh, for about 35 minutes and then we're gonna have some time for Q&A. So you uh, feel free to type your question in the Q&A section, or at the end, if you would like to ask your question directly, just raise your hand, I'd be able to unmute you, and then you can directly ask your question. All right, let's start uh, about today's talk. Today, we have a very special guest with a very special uh, topic and very interesting and special topic. So we are lucky to have Dr. Greg Adamson today. Um, uh, he is an associate professor at the University of Melbourne um, at CIS department, and also he is a consultant um, and the principal at the Digital Risk Innovation. Greg works in the social implication of technology, including cybersecurity, and he is a past uh, president of RGPLE Society on Social Implications of Technology. Greg has spoken in many IoT events and conferences, including RGPLE World Forum on IoT. So um, he is um, constantly seizing difficult opportunities from cybersecurity to blockchain to AI ethics in different domains in health, banking, and government. And today he is going to give a talk on IoT and the myth of measurement. So I'll stop here and hand it over to Greg to talk about this interesting topic. Greg, please. Thanks, Fatima. That's a great introduction. So what I want to speak about today is IoT, because that's what the series is about. But there are various aspects of IoT, and I think the topic that I'm going to speak about today is probably further away from the technical than uh, most other talks. I, this, is not, uh, this is not accidental. For the last four years, I've been supervising a PhD student uh, who's been studying the philosophy of IoT. And during that, uh, during that period, so this was with the history and philosophy of science uh, department at the University of Melbourne. Uh, so it's a collaboration between the technical and uh, technology and humanities sides. And through that, uh, through that discussion, many important, many important and interesting questions have arisen, which I uh, are not mine to uh, describe. It's the, it's the work of uh, Paul Seamus who's doing that. But it did raise, it did raise the question for me uh, a couple of years ago. I started looking at the problem that IoT makes assumptions about the ability to deliver technology in a holistic solution. And if we look at, uh, if we look at something like um, smart uh, IoT enabled uh, smart vehicles, say autonomous cars, and the idea that if we can put enough sensors along the road and in the car, we can safely guide that car even if the car doesn't have a perfect understanding of the, the road around it. So this idea of completeness is a very important part of IoT, but that uh, incompleteness comes at an expense and the expense is uh, a level of understanding, which is also necessary. So to, to begin with, I've, used, I've deliberately used the word myth and myth is a, is a provocative term. Uh, the relationship between measurement and control is, is important. And the myth that we can control what we measure pervades technology. I'll say a little bit further about how that concept of control and measurement came about. But it, 
is it is widely uh, widely viewed, and the idea that if we as we apply IoT to healthcare, uh, embedding devices everywhere and understanding things, uh, esports, um, and particularly active esports where we monitor the physical location of a person, and from that enable them to participate in a sort of vir virtual augmented reality environment. Uh, within the natural environment where we use, we place lots and lots of sensors and have an understanding of how the natural environment is working or in cyber physical applications in every, uh, where we have both the, the digital and the analog combining together, uh, cybernetics as the gateway for those to, to connect. The knowledge we have in each of those cases is partial. And one may say, well, partial knowledge is good. We can gradually have more sensors and have a more complete understanding, but that actually misses the point. The, the, the important point is that the knowledge is not complete. And as we design our systems, we need to design our systems to understand, to be aware that the knowledge on which they're working is not complete. So here are some examples of the sort of areas that IoT is coming into today. We have, uh, and I've given three examples, smart cities, active esports, and smart farms. So if we look at, what I, if, if we look at what IoT does technology in a fundamentally different way, Partly it's the sheer scale of IoT devices where um, there are seven or 8 billion people in the world. We already have multiple IoT, IoT devices for each person, uh, not equally spread across the world, of course. We have uh, discussions of tens of billions of IoT devices. And as these become smaller, cheaper, more flexible, more convenient, more easily dispersed, uh, playing a wider role, we can expect that number to, to continue rising astronomically. When we look at the, the I've just picked a, a couple of graphics here, we look at the smart cities, the idea that within the city, everything within the city is monitored. It's the roads, it's the airspace, it's the buildings, it's the, um, the, the other vehicles, uh, it's the uh, air conditioning, it's the uh, what such manufacturing as you get in the city. It's all of the, it's the things under the city, the sewerage, the, uh, the management of all the services to the city. Each of these, I'd say without exaggeration, every one of these is the subject of enormous IoT research today. Uh, there is no area that is not being of this sort that is not being researched. The, fi the, the physicality of the city is being examined very closely. It's being monitored, it's being censored, it's being potentially activated with IoT devices. If we look at the smart farm, this gives an even um, more uh, intrusive approach. So within, within a smart farm, we can, uh, we can imagine that the watering on the farm is done according to the needs of the location. So you water an area within the farm because it is dry, not because you schedule that much water to be spread over that much farmland. If you can have devices within the soil that are reporting on the humidity of the soil in a particular location, and you can have smart watering devices that distribute the water where that is needed, this will lead to an enormous increase in control over the humidity of the soil and therefore the conditions under which the plants are growing. This is, uh, this is fantastic uh, in the opportunity that it can create. Uh, simpler, Simpler process is the tracking of all animals. We've been we've been tracking farm animals for a long time. I remember I, we, I worked in quarantine back in the 1990s, and we had a tail tag system that 
identified uh, that identified cattle. Uh, today, we today there are much more sophisticated systems. It can identify a particular cattle as that system could, but it can then distribute the uh, food to the to that uh, to that particular animal. Uh, antibiotics. Uh, it can measure. It can keep track of that individual animal's weight, and the dis the massive dispersion of devices makes that possible. Uh, active sports. So active esports, uh, where esports have been with us for many years, uh, and now the technology is moving forward as we have the ability to place ourselves within cyberspace, um, not just mentally. It's this isn't just the early '90s where we could imagine that we're in a dungeon uh, fighting dragons. This is visually, we. Uh, we can now uh, place sensors on our hands. We can place sensors around our, our bodies. We can then go into a place which uh, safely allows us to move around without crashing into things uh, with uh, seeing a, as I've said, or some sort of uh, augmented or virtual extended reality. And these, these sensors enable us to do so much more than we could previously do. So that's the, to a certain extent, that's the reality, but more than that, it's a promise. It's a promise that eventually we can connect everything. Now, uh, I've just, I've got a, di this is a diagram from a couple of years ago. It's the idea, the, the promise of universal interconnection. And there are two points about this. One is everything gets, everything gets connected, all the things but the other thing is, which is a slightly different statement, everything that's important gets connected. And connecting everything versus connecting everything that's important, if you mix up those two concepts, uh, then, then, we have, then, then we get into a troubling space. So I want to, just, just uh, taking, this, taking this image here and the sort of, the sort of examples they have, Firstly, we have the traditional idea of a network, of a computer network. So the concept of a computer network where you network your, uh, your, CP, your, your uh, central processing, you network your printers, you network your access, your terminals, all those pieces, that's been around since the uh, 1950s or definitely since the 1960s. Then we take a number of devices that weren't previously networked, such as the light bulb or the um, our watch or scales and so on, or devices that were networked differently, such as a microphone, which could have been connected to its own particular network, but not connected to a broader uh, digital network, such as the internet is. We connect all of these things together and it creates this sense that it's simply a matter of new frontiers. We just find more frontiers and we just connect more things and eventually we'll have everything uh, connected that we need to connect. And when I say need to connect, that's sort of another way of saying everything that's important and it suffers the same vulnerability. Now, the challenge, let's, let's look at that vulnerability a little bit specifically. And I want, to, I want to quote W. Edwards Deming. And Deming is famous for his, um, um, for, the, uh, for his cycle, the cycles that he introduced, the Plan, Do, Check, Act cycle and the other, and the other things that he introduced into the automotive industry um, in the 1950s and 60s. Now, Deming early on was... Uh, Deming had a strong understanding of feedback and of cybernetics. He was one of the early uh, participants in the, before cybernetics was called cybernetics. He was one of the early collaborators with Norbert Wiener, the founder of cybernetics in the 1940s. And he developed this idea that we can manage things which we can't measure, which is very important. Uh, and the, the, important, the importance there is you can't directly manage it, but you manage it in other ways. And particularly you manage it through feedback. 
you manage by observing uh, its behavior. So you don't need to be able to measure everything. If you can observe the behavior of something and then respond to that behavior, that also enables you to, uh, to, to, manage, to manage things. And you can manage many things which you can't manage by direct observation in that way. The problem with, uh, so Deming uh, was a brilliant, uh, a brilliant, the uh, brilliant theorist and industry practitioner. There, there are, there are a few people in his league. Uh, the difficulty is that his quote, this this wonderful quote he made, is is normally truncated, and they and the way people truncate it, they call they say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So they actually take the entire point out of the quote and leave it as something that's uh, that's uh, very bare and not very uh, and not true. So the way I'd summarize uh, the the amount of knowledge that IoT can provide us is that IoT gives us enormous amounts of information. If you can imagine, say, 35 or 50 billion devices streaming streaming information, even if they're not streaming information, even if they're only stream, streaming information every minute, not every uh, microsecond, the and some are streaming at every microsecond or smaller periods of time, the amount of information coming out of those uh, 35 to 50 billion devices is enormous. And I would, I would assert that that gives us, that does not give us complete knowledge. What it gives us is the capacity for confusion. We have enough information to confuse us, not, un, not enough information to, to know everything in a godlike sense. This is a, an example, of, uh, I, I've called it IT, IoT backdraft. So what goes wrong now? Um, and enough things to be out of control, but not to know everything, uh, as, I, as I just said. So I, li I like this cartoon. I, it's from a couple of years ago now, but it's still, uh, it's still very relevant. And it's the idea of somebody's got a smart kitchen. Everything, they've connected everything in there. Uh, in their kitchen to the internet and some of it's not really apart from the broom um, uh, it's not really it's not difficult to imagine all of these devices iot connected uh, and probably they all exist in an iot connected form um, and the result is rather than a smoothly functioning kitchen in the image of the jetsons the old cartoon uh, the old cartoon, television cartoon, we have uh, hack. We have an unmitigated uh, disaster, security disaster, and this is because the devices that we can all imagine in this picture are all poorly protected in the first instance. That is, so IoT has certain characteristics, which if you if you work in IoT, you'd be familiar with. They have. They have a characteristic that they don't have a lot of power. They don't have a lot of energy power and they don't have a lot of computational power. And this means that solving the problem of securing IoT devices is not trivial. Uh, even, even something as simple as how do you create an interface to an IoT device that allows its um, software or firmware or hardware if that's where the, some of the stuff is stored to be upgraded, uh, how do you do? How do you um, get that? I'll, I'll give you a silly example. Um, how many people know how? Or not a silly. This is a serious example. How many people know how to change the password on the IoT connection on their television set? Uh, and I'm talking to a technical audience here. Um, I'd be. You know, if somebody knows how to do that, I'd be. Uh, impressed. I certainly don't. Uh, I certainly don't. I think for even for technical people, simply having confidence that our local printer is appropriately connected can be can be a challenge. And for the vast majority of people, that would be impossible. They would not have a clue how to start to consider that. And when you get to smart fridges, smart TVs, and so on, it becomes uh, very very different. So that's the so. 
we we go through this in uh, we look at these and we think how did it how did we actually get to so many insecure things being uh, being released on the world? Now I've put the I've said here uh, I've predicted here sustained uh, petabit DDoS attacks. We don't currently have those. We currently have sustained terabit uh, DDoS attacks, but this is massive denial, uh, distributed denial of service attacks, where these devices in the kitchen and other devices, particularly uh, um, uh, particularly uh, in, uh, scre um, sorry, particularly cameras uh, are installed with a default password, then then taken over, then then used to generate traffic, which is then directed at a particular target, and we have a denial of service attack. Uh, well known, it's been around for a few years now. Uh, very simple to do. Now, why does this matter? Uh, so we can say, okay, so the television set is maybe insecure. Well, some of those things definitely matter. For example, if the child monitor is insecure, so you're actually posting images of your children when you're trying to protect your children, then that matters. That's, that's not a good look. Um, but more generally, and, that, and that's consumer IoT devices, security and consumer IoT devices is a major focus of, of research today. I want to talk more generally about a, a, an industry problem. And the question of industry is important. And I'll talk, I've got a few slides about industry. So in the early 90s, the Purdue reference model provided comfort that we could securely uh, protect our um, security and our secure environment, that we could achieve um, cybersecurity in our in our secure environment. And I just want to pick out, just looking at it, it's it's a nice little layered device. Everyone wants layers. Um, and at the top, so the way they've done this, this layered device is uh, we, they have a, a network. What you don't see here is outside there's a, um, there'll be, there'll be uh, the internet. So the internet will connect to the network. Uh, the network will then have a, a protective um, firewalls, um, which uh, prevent the, um, hacker, hackers coming in. Um, we then have uh, factory applications. So there are uh, applications that allow, uh, that, that, that have protection. Um, and these, these address concerns, uh, considerations such as uh, remote access server. So RAS is always, was always a security issue because people, support staff may dial in and and you've got to address that and then you've got the um and then you've got the actual factory uh, systems the SCADA systems that are controlling the various interfaces right down at the bottom you have um the uh the controls the controls that are actually managing the machines and then within the machines you've got the sensors the drives the actua the actuators um, or the machines maybe that are being driven, maybe the robots, and you've got that process happening right down at the bottom, very secure, a long way away from the uh, the dangerous internet. Now that that was the early nineties. Nice diagram. Uh, IoT breaks that. Uh, I don't want to put that too bluntly. Um, it doesn't work anymore. And I put it in a couple of circles down the bottom. So imagine you've got all of that protection, all of those things which are going to protect those actuators and robot, those drives and robots, those uh, milling machines, all of those machines, the the other devices. In an electricity environment, it could be the the uh, the, the substations. Those sensors are now IoT enabled. Those sensors and actuators are now wirelessly enabled and the wireless connections to those devices does not carefully go up through all of those layers in this model to be super, super protected from that horrible internet. Those wireless sensors 
uh, depending on their de uh, device and, uh, and architecture, uh, will be directly vulnerable to attack, even if they're not designed to be directly vulnerable to attack. And by the time, if we've got a distributed environment where there are thousands of these sensors and we happen to choose sensors that aren't very, um, very secure, then we introduce vulnerability. Just like to give an example, my, my favorite example, and I find this quite delightful, was a, and this is in the financial services industry, but it's a cyber physical example as well. So we had a casino, a very, a very famous case of a casino, and the casino was super well protected, and because there's a lot of money in a casino. And so this super well protected casino had a fish pond, because People want to see fish. People want to see fish swimming around. And by remotely, by connecting the uh, fish pond to the network, you could do things like you know, monitor the quality of the water or remotely actuate the feed uh, or something like that. So that, that would obviously be a big benefit. What they didn't pay attention to was the fact that the uh, fish pond security was designed by fish pond manufacturers and fish pond manufacturers aren't used to protecting hundreds of millions of dollars. They're used to keeping the fish alive worth between 50 cents and $50 each. And so the hackers broke in through the fish pond and stole the money from the, stole millions of dollars from the casino. Now that's, that's a very humorous example because you sort of think, the casino gambled and they lost. Ha ha. Uh, it becomes less humorous when we think of the way a car is designed, that the entertainment system in a car may be insecure, but the bus that that entertainment system is connected to also connects to the car's motor uh, and braking systems. So that somebody who can, somebody can break in through the IoT enabled devices, entertainment devices on a car and hack the car's brakes. Not a good look. So this sort of, this takes us into a philosophical space, which is, uh, and I've used the quote, the map, a map is not the territory it represents. And that, and that gets us thinking, if we think about IoT from that point of view, imagine IoT with devices everywhere. So, so distributing around, distributed around farmland, sitting in all the different parts of the city, in all the, in all the parts of all the parts of the city. Um, so um, Alfred Korzybski uh, made, made this comment in 31, and then he put it into a book in 1933. And he said, uh, it may be, it's useful, but it's only useful, it's not the actual thing itself. Now, that didn't cause us so many problems when we were dealing with IT, because within IT, within a digital environment, the map of the IT is to some extent the IT. If I understand the map of the program, the map of the architecture, the map of the objects with that the the map of the data that is being handled within an IT system, I have a pretty good clue of, of that system. It may not exactly react as I expect, but it sort of reacts that way. So why, can't, why is IoT more complicated than a digital system? Why is it more complicated than a program? Now, the digital world is a series of approximate of the analog world around us. Um, for those who aren't familiar with this, there's a thing called quantize, uh, quantization error, I think it is. And this, this is the idea that everything we measure, so whether we're measuring a color or a sound or a, day or, or a moment, they're all approximations. And depending on how, offer, how often we're measuring or the, how discrete the measurement is, the approximations will be closer or further away on average. From, from the truth, sorry, from the truth. And that takes us to a, 
And that means that every one of those digital approximation, every one of those digital values is an approximation. Every digital value of an analog value is an approximation of that value, and there will always be errors. Now, this Nyquist established this in 1928 in his, um, this was actually in an IEEE journal or a pre, one of the IEEE's predecessors. Uh, he published this paper explaining um, uh, digitization and quantization. Now, digital technologies, don't get me wrong, digital technologies can be very complicated, uh, but, uh, but there's a but. IoT operates in the cyber physical domain. And that means that's the intersection of the digital, which is information technology and the analog, which in the technology sense is operational technology. And I'll say more about operational technology in a moment. Now, this is far more the cyber physical domain or the cyber physical overlapping of domains is far more complicated than digital technology by itself. And this complexity also includes a social dimension, which I'll talk about in a moment. Okay, now information technology and operational technology. Information technology is a term that's been around for decades, for most of the century. Um, operational technology is a concept that's been around for thousands of years, but it's a term that's only been around for a decade or so. It's quite a new term and it's, it's describing everything that isn't information technology. And what that means is it's describing, because information technology is digital primarily, it's really describing analog technologies. So uh, IT is re it represents the world digitally and it's an, it does that with enormous speed and efficiency, particularly through Moore's law where we're able to undertake trillions of calculations or trillion, trillions of steps uh, every second with the current level of sophistication uh, or with massively, massively parallel computers, much more than that. Now, operational technology works directly in the analog world. So if I'm looking at a transformer in a substation, uh, this is a power distribution network. I've got a transformer in a substation and I want to know how contaminated the oil, the cooling oil is in that transformer. Now that's, that's analog. Now I can digitally approximate the, the temperature, the number of um, uh, the, the quality of that oil, the, the number of impurities, um, the range of impurities in that oil and so on. I can approximate that, but, uh, and, uh, a digital approximation is useful, but that's just an approximation. So I, IoT provides the interface between the IT and the OT. And that's not just, I'm not just playing on letters here. Uh, that is, IoT works in the cyber physical space and you can represent those as the IT world and the OT world. Now, we get to a funny situation, which is, and I, when I talk about cultural and uh, cultural issues here, I'm not, not talking about cultural issues such as the humanities. I'm talking about the culture of IT workers and the culture of operational technology workers. I'll give you an example. IT workers are very happy with the concept of uh, release in beta. So the idea that um, you release something, people start using it, they find bugs, they report the bugs back, then you gradually fix it so that over, over time the new version of the word processor uh, doesn't freeze or the new version of the operating system doesn't have a blue screen of death. But sometimes it still does. Now that's, a, that's an IT view. An OT view is, that's crazy. That is completely insane. When you try to explain that view to an OT person, they say, you reckon I'm gonna put in a transformer I'm going to spend millions of dollars putting in a substation and the thing's going to blow up. And then I'm going to try to learn from why it blew up and do it better next time. Uh, no, no, no. We want, we want five nines for, or six nines reliability here. We don't, this, uh, this release in beta stuff doesn't work for us. Now we can see the problem when a, when a company ignores that approach. So when they say, so supposing 
you have a technology and something goes wrong, you tweak the software a bit, then you try again and then something goes wrong again. Well, Boeing, that's what Boeing did. So the, they had, a, they had a, a plane crash, lots of people were killed. They tweaked the, uh, the programming a little bit. They said, yeah, this will be okay. Another plane, I'm sorry. I'm not saying that they didn't care, but this is what they did culturally. This is what they actually did. They applied an IT approach to an operational technology pro program. And as, as a result, they had two plane loads full of people killed. They lost all their customers for that airplane. They were banned from selling it. Uh, they then announced that it wouldn't ever fly again. It's, that's, uh, IT companies can't afford to make those mistakes when, they, when they're working in the OT, in the OT world. But that, so that's a cultural thing. But then the OT person will say, I want this and this and this. And the IT person will say, no, we can't give you that, but we can give you this other stuff much faster. And so it's only through integrating those two approaches with a clear understanding of what you're trading off, make sure you're not trading off uh, safety uh, and stuff like that, that, that you can develop um, that in that space. So I've asked a couple of questions here. Does IT, IoT strengthen critical infrastructure? Now, there's absolutely no question that it improves our knowledge of critical infrastructure. No question whatsoever. We introduce tens of billions of IoT devices, but as I've got here, we then create an infinite attack surface. There is no way that we can work out. We do not have the capacity. We do not have machines that have the capacity to determine everything that could go wrong when you combine billions of uh, devices together. Uh, for life dependent services from critical infrastructure to healthcare adoption shouldn't outpace our capacity to protect. So I guess what I'm saying here is that if you have a situation like the kitchen I described earlier, that shouldn't happen. We should, our capacity to protect should at least go hand in hand, if not going ahead of our ability or our willingness to, to roll out these devices. In cybersecurity, in the, in the healthcare sector, does IoT improve our healthcare protection? Now, just this is a wonderful report here. Healthcare Industry Cyber Security Task Force came out uh, three years ago now. Still excellent, still the best report available on the issue. And it, it, it takes up this question and it says, it talks about the challenge of securing uh, healthcare data and medical devices, particularly medical devices. This is the one that called out the danger of medical devices. These are both consumer and clinical. Uh, and it calls out IoT um, and the importance of addressing IoT. So uh, coming to the end, what does IoT measure? When we believe that IoT includes everything, we forget what IoT ignores or fails to measure. Now I've got this, ZNet's a great, uh, uh, yeah, uh, is a great source. Um, I love their stuff. I read their articles all the time. Uh, I got this, I took this uh, photo from one of their articles and you look at IoT here and the first thing you notice, the first thing you notice is the, the way they sort of, they, the whole way that they've uh, imaged this suggests a, uh, a digital engagement. So they don't have, so all of these devices they're connecting to, they're all digital. Now there's, I don't actually see any sensors in this picture. Maybe I'm missing them, but uh, the, sec the sensors and the actuators, they're not in the picture. This is a digital view of IoT. And we have to understand that is not IoT. That is not IoT. That does not start to untangle the complexity of IoT. So if we just think that we're gonna connect these devices, then we can imagine that we're in a lot more control than, than we actually are. Now to, to, finish on, to finish with a slide and a photo that I, I like a lot, what does IoT forget? This is a photo from, this is, these are secondary students in Melbourne last year, um, concerned about the state of the planet and the importance of uh, protecting the planet. Uh, so IoT, um, it doesn't measure the unmeasurable things that we care about. It doesn't think of the things we can't protect yet. And it doesn't 
protect the things we don't know about or measure the things we don't know about yet. So the idea of IoT measuring and allowing us to control everything, so that picture in our minds that we can control everything through IoT is a weakness, not a strength. IoT is an enormous opportunity, one we must understand and prepare for, but it's not one that we can take for granted. We need to be aware of what we need to be aware of, of what we need to understand, of what's missing from the picture that our IoT gives us. And so on that point, I'll be happy to take any questions. Hey, thank you very much, Greg. That was uh, very informative and interesting talk. It's great to think about the social implications of IoT, what, when we are enhancing the IoT into our lives. Um, and things that you mentioned, they, they absolutely food for thoughts as we develop more and more IoT systems. Um, yeah, we have 20 minutes for, for any questions. Uh, you can type your question in the Q&A section or you can raise your hand. Um, I, I, I'd be able to unmute you and uh, you can ask your question directly. All right, any questions? So I can start ask one question. I know that you, you've been working on um, ethics in AI um, and also like IoT. So um, I was also thinking, is it possible uh, by using more data coming from IoT sensors and devices, we would be able to improve the ethics in AI or uh, it might like complicate the, that if we uh, get uh, like um, um, data coming automatically uh, from the devices, uh, do you have any uh, like idea about like connecting these two uh, together? Yeah. So I think it's inevitable that the data coming out of IoT devices will have to be examined using AI. The volumes. So if I've got if I've got an IoT device that um, is con that, that when it reaches a certain temperature, it turns a tap on or something like that. That that's fine. But IoT device, but you could do that with the with the old activators and the old uh, thermostats and things like that. Uh, IoT's benefit is in the processing of large numbers of pieces of information to give us insights which we wouldn't have previously had. I gave the example of the farm of the of the devices in the soil monitoring the the moisture of the soil. And once you have that sort of data, you can't process that beyond a trivial example. You couldn't process that manually, even if you had thousands of people working full time on it. It's so IoT lends itself through its sheer volume. It lends itself to the adoption of AI uh, approaches in order to, uh, in order to um, make use of the data. So I'd say the, the connection there is, is, and the question is a very good one. The, the connection that you've asked actually provides us with a hint to the answer. So when people are designing IoT devices, I, I, maybe I'm spinning it around a little bit. When people are designing I, IoT devices or systems of IoT devices, and the application of those systems of IoT devices, they need to be aware that it will be an AI device that's taking the outputs and is using the outputs. So it will not have any intelligence because by definition, AI has no intelligence. So the ability that my, the favorite picture I love there is the, the autonomous bus that drove into a river. Um, now there's nothing, an autonomous bus is driving along a, a road and you know, to the right, there's a right-hand turn to the left, there's a river. It just turned right. It just turned left instead of right. Now there's no possibility that a person in their right mind would drive into a river. It'll just occur to them. No, if I drive into the yeah. river, we'll 
sink or get wet or whatever. Uh, but this, and that's common sense. But AI devices don't have common sense. Uh, they don't have sense. They're not intelligent at this stage of their development. Um, so we need to think what that mean, what that would mean as we as we're putting those sensors in place. If we think, oh well, of course nobody would do. Uh, if we might, if we've got those sensors doing things, so supposing we had, we had sensors which would, um, I'll give an upsetting, but not particularly. Uh, no, I'll give an upsetting example. Suppose you have an AI device that's feeding the cattle on a farm, and uh, that's measuring the amount of food that that the cattle are getting, and suppose you don't, you don't, you forget the principle of fail safe. And something goes wrong with your AI device. Uh, it fails for some reason. And you can you can very easily think of a very distraught animal there that is denied food and starves to death. Um, that would be that's a pretty upsetting um, yes. scenario. So when when people are designing those IoT devices in the farms, they have to know that the animals won't be able to complain and point out how stupid something is. That they're literally taking, they're, 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 they've got the life of that animal in their in their hands as they're designing those things. So that's um, that's a reason that AI that AI people need to think about always need to think about ethics in in AI devices. As far as the, uh, I would say on the other side from the people who are working with AI. They need to understand the limitations of the data coming out of the um, coming out of the IoT devices, um, and sometimes that can be, uh, you know, if an IoT device is able to measure between two different measurement values, but can't measure above a certain amount. If the temperature goes above a certain amount, the IoT device is not going to warn of that, and so therefore the AI designer has to know the limitations of the AI devices who are providing data for them to work with. Yep. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Let's see if anyone has. Okay. Hello. So we've got a question in the chat. Um, speaking of ethics and privacy issues. Are IoT security and user privacy directly related to each other, or it is just a myth? Right. So I gave the example of the IoT security of the, of the IoT cameras monitoring children, um, and in that case, that's an actual example uh, of, uh, and you you. It's very easy to show that that's an actual example because the devices were banned. Um, they they were made in certain jurisdictions. They were made illegal to use those particular devices for that particular purpose because they weren't considering privacy and because they were dealing with the privacy of children. Um, that's so. That's a that's a fairly simple. That's evidence, but it's not actually an argument. Uh, I think it's. I think it's. This is a good question. So, the question of the relationship between security uh, and privacy is quite a uh, contested one. So, there are arguments. There are some arguments that say we have a continuum between security and privacy. And so either we have lots of privacy and no security, or we have lots of security and no privacy. And that's a that's commonly an argument used by people who don't understand technology. It's commonly an argument used in used by government policymakers. And the best answer to that, in my experience, comes out of the secure out of the technology security community, particularly the work of Bruce Schneier, who does a wonderful uh, does a wonderful blog. And if people aren't if People are new to security and haven't heard of Schneier. He is definitely 
a very accessible writer, and very easy to understand. He, he, he's absolutely up to date. He's very famous, very well respected. And um, when something happens in the security community, he'll write about it within like hours or within 24 hours or something like that. So you can very quickly, when some disaster happens or some president makes some announcement about how nobody can hack him, um, then uh, you can find very quickly find responses. Actually, I haven't checked that one. I'm assuming he responded on that one. Um, so the if we think about so let's let's go back to that question about the uh, a scale uh, or a continuum more privacy equals less security schneier argues that it's actually the opposite way around that if we have good and productive security this protects our privacy if we break our security we break our privacy as well um and that's there, there's quite a big debate about that in relation to to policy in australia very good some very good writers on that people from the university of melbourne people such as vanessa teague and sulet dreyfus who are very well informed and and write have written broadly on this question going back to um going back to iot the However, as I said, there is a trade-off with IoT, and the trade-off is driven by the physical limitations, the limitations of power, the limitations of computational power, the limitations of size, for that matter, um, which, which mean that IoT is not the you can't you can't take a mainframe approach to to security in an IoT environment. You need to take a different approach, and that is. So the, the point there is that as we look at using IoT devices, we have a responsibility to know what the capacity of that device is and to not apply the device where it's not fit for purpose. Uh, so that um, if we're, you know, if we, if we have a if we have a device that doesn't have security implications, sorry, that doesn't have safety or health and safety implications, then we don't have to take the same precautions as we do when we are designing systems that do have uh, health and safety implications, including privacy. Okay, great. Any other questions from audience? Uh, Greg, uh, this had a uh, very nice talk. Uh, the, uh, thank you very uh, very much for this talk. Just one question regarding not about ethics and privacy, regarding AI. Uh, uh, as uh, as we know, AI is not mature uh, and uh, it does have a uh, lots of uh, problem like data quality issues, lots of things, also the errors and uh, uh, it couldn't, uh, for example, just uh, it is kind of estimation techniques. And uh, so how uh, uh, AI, uh, how we can trust this IoT technology they are using uh, AI? Is it just some kind of uh, can be used as a, a guidelines say that, for example, for the agriculture, we can use AI, but uh, we can't trust the output that output is kind of hint or help for uh, agriculture to see that what is the moisture but it is not it could be some errors there so what what do you think about this any uh, particular iot using ai and uh, for yeah thank you right so one of the one of the principles that was that emerged in the 1990s i think it might have been around a little bit longer uh, in technology was the idea of being able to build robust systems out of uh, cheap parts. Um, so, for example, in the case of um, disk drives, the concept that statistic, you could show statistically that even you didn't need to use the most expensive disk drives. If you had an array of cheaper disk drives, you could still achieve an enormously high level of reliability through the use of several simult simultaneously several disk drives because they don't all fail, even though they might fail every 10,000 hours instead of every million hours, 
uh, they don't all fail at the same time, all other things being equal. And so that gave, that created the possibility of, of um, low cost, high reliability through redundancy. Yeah. The, that, that concept had actually been described much earlier by a, by a researcher, Prasanta Chandra Mahalanobis, who was the founder of the Indian Statistical Institute. And he designed the, he did work in the 19, late 1920s and 1930s on this. And it was the basis of the, um, of the Indian census in 1951. And what he was able to do was by taking a small sample or a small total sample of the country, but using overlapping samples, he was able to eliminate errors, individual uh, errors related to particular collectors. So if one person tended to overcount or another person tended to, over, to undercount, if you integrate all the results of these people and you have overlapping areas, so instead of surveying 3% of the country, you survey 1.5% of the country, but you have overlapping errors, the, the accuracy you can achieve is, uh, is outstandingly impressive. So what I would, what I'd say is that in terms of, and this also relates to feedback, the question of feedback uh, and the ability to identify errors, the ability to correct for errors as you're actually measuring this sort of idea, that's a very cybernetic idea. Um, th that these techniques are, are highly valuable and they've been around for a long time. They, they, like I'm, I'm describing things that have been available for nearly a hundred years, methods for nearly a hundred years. So the, the only problem is that people may not, people may think, oh, why would we bother doing that? So I would say that while we're in the period, while we're in the early period of AI, if we do introduce safety mechanisms like that, we can understand our vulnerabilities and we can correct a lot of those vulnerabilities and we can make systems much safer so rather than just say, no, we can't use this technology, there are ways we can think about trying to use the technology. But the key thing is we have to think about it. This stuff doesn't just emerge naturally. You have, you have to have people who are multidisciplinary expertise where people can draw from all the various parts and build robust systems in a, in a period of early knowledge regarding AI. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Probably the last one. So Greg, can you introduce um, uh, like a reference or like blog if uh, uh, our audience, they want to learn more about implica social implications of IoT systems? Um, any references that you can recommend? Uh, so I would definitely recommend people looking at uh, the uh, the Social Implications of Technology Society website and our magazine. So we have a magazine, Technology and Society, IEEE magazine on technology and society. We have a, a website, uh, which is www.technologyandsociety.org. Uh, we have a conference, the International Symposium on Technology and Society, happening in a couple of weeks. That's an online conference. So strongly encourage people to um uh to look at those uh and yep and that's yep, that, uh, that's great good references and uh it's good um now we are able to join the, the social like the virtual conferences um mm. and accessing all those information that's great thank you so much greg for joining us especially today is a public holiday thanks for your time and for this informative and uh, useful uh, talk. Thanks, Greg. And thanks, everyone, for joining uh, this talk. All right. Great. See you. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye.